Well, I'm here not to introduce one of the fine young people, but a rather old guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to introduce Pat Collins, uh, uh, and he's also a possible new member. We need to work on him, so after he's done, if you would, uh, engage him. Pat Collins is the Riley County Emergency Management Director with a wide-ranging portfolio. He grew up here in Riley County in the city of Ogden and attended Garden City Community College in K-State. He has been blessed to be married to Carol for over 40 years, and they have one daughter, Christine, and two grandchildren. Now, Pat started uh, his career with Riley County back in 1977 as a Kansas first responder for EMS, but has served the citizens of Riley County in multiple capacities, some of which are the RCPD police reserve officer, volunteer firefighter for Riley uh, District Number 1, volunteer firefighter for Ogden, and the Ogden Fire Chief. In 1991, he was appointed as the Riley County Emergency Coordinator and the Riley County Assistant Fire Chief. A few year, years later, after the flood of 93, and we all learned a lot about that, uh, the County Commission restructured the Emergency Management Office and appointed Pat as Director, Riley County Emergency Management uh, Director, Fire District Number One Fire Chief, and Emergency Communications uh, Director. That's three big titles. Uh, for big responsibilities. A large part of his day is devoted to managing volunteers for the emergency management and fire district. He coordinates over 170 volunteers operating out of 16 different stations, and this is akin to herding uh, rabid cats at a hunting dog trial. Uh, work with volunteers, you know what I mean. Volunteers make owning a home outside the city uh, limits possible by offering their time, talents, and energies to provide fire, firefighting protection, uh, without which insurance would be impossible, without which, and likewise, uh, uh, a uh, mortgage would be impossible. Pat excels in this area, recruiting, training, and uh, retaining our volunteers in an ongoing battle with time, opportunity, and commitment. Riley County has one of the finest volunteer fire and emergency response organizations in the states, widely recognized. Pat has led Riley County through three presidential disasters. Can you name them? I could. I could. The flood of 93, the 2008 tornado, and the flood of 2010 to 2011. Those were all presidential uh, disasters that uh, he's uh, led us through. He's also deployed his skills to assist others for Hurricane Katrina and Montgomery County flooding. Pat has not confined his talents and efforts to Riley County. Uh, the service he's given the state efforts is impressive. Here are a few. He's an instructor for the Kansas Fire Rescue Training Institute, instructor for the Kansas Division of Emergency Management, uh, a Kansas Certified Emergency Manager, a Radiological Instructor 3, I have no idea what that is, uh, Firefighter 2, Pretty sure I know what that is. Certified <coughs> Fire Officer, Fire Service Instructor, Kansas State Fire Chiefs Association Officer, and President of the Kansas State Emergency Management Association. He's also the Vice Chair of the Kansas 911 Council. He passed that duty off on to me. <laughs> uh, and uh, he has been appointed by the Governor to the Kansas State Commission on Emergency Planning and Response. When he's not preparing Riley County for the next emergency, Pat enjoys hunting, fishing, boating, and his family as a husband, father, and grandfather. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Kansas Emergency Manager of the Year for 2015, Pat Collins. Hey. Some, some burning issues and uh, last time I was here we talked about things I do and in our department and uh, I thought maybe we ought to concentrate on on the burning issues that we have now so uh, she said I could talk for at least two hours and, uh, <laughs> you can talk as long as you want but you want to have an audience they're going to gonna start bailing off you right now no I, uh, I appreciate that and, and I think there, there's some uh, some concerns out there right now, and, and, and I need to get those out to, to people, and I think you can help me do that. Um, if, if you look at it, let's kind of go back. Uh, the, the state burning regulations were, were, were put out in, in 1996, and uh, they actually prohibit burning. 
anything. Now, just like any other state regulation, it's, there's exemptions to build into that. And uh, the exemptions that we have uh, allow for burning on residential property uh, of less than five residences. Um, it allows for cooking and ceremonial burning. And I've seen a lot of farmers out there that say that this is this is almost a religious thing for them. <laughs> um, we uh, I see one back here. Uh, we have we have uh, crop burning, range burning, wildlife watershed areas. Those type of things can be burned, uh, and as approved by KDAT. So they've got their own statute that outlines the things that they can do. Uh, what it does do, though, is say that uh, we can we can uh, regulate locally more stringent than the, the state regulations, and, and we do have our own our own uh, regulations. I'll kind of get into those here in a little bit. Uh, one of the things it does is outlines agricultural burning, and and it starts to refer to uh, the local regulations. It talks about not creating traffic hazards. How many of you remember the uh, Matfield Green thing a few years ago where they had smoke cross the road and they actually had a fatality accident? Um, talks about not burning near an airport and, and being able to work around that and then supervising the fire. And part of the regulations actually put the responsibility of that controlled burn or prescribed fire, whatever you want to call it, back on the property owner. So if you own the property, if you lease the property, and you have some, even if you have somebody else come in and do the burning, you're still responsible for that fire. And, and a lot of people don't understand that. They, and, and there are a few people around the, the state that travel around and do agricultural burning for people. Um, one of the concerns that, uh, that we have locally is, and the reason we have a regulation, a local regulation, is to get that that uh, responsibility. Okay, you, you have a permit to burn. This is the person that's going to be burning. This is the property that we're gonna burn onto. So so we can go back and, okay, any, anything that burns up on the neighbor's property or the next neighbor's property goes back and that responsibility falls on that person that started that fire and the property. So uh, we, we pay a lot of attention to that locally on how that how that works through the burn permit system. A couple of years ago, uh, 2011 actually, the uh, EPA decided to change the regulations for the particulate matter in the air, so the, the uh, clean air regulations. And so uh, in, in, in doing that, Kansas actually exceeded some of those particular uh, limitations and, and it was basically a couple days in April um, and it was a couple a couple of years in a row so they, they came back down to Kansas and says hey you need to regulate this you don't have a, a plan you don't have a smoke management plan if you had a smoke management plan then you would address how you're going to deal with these exceedances so uh, a group of people, it was, it was more people than that are in this room right now, got together probably about 10 times, came up with a uh, smoke management plan and, and put that into place. Well, it, it actually created its own regulation in, the, uh, in, in KDHE's books that said uh, during the, the uh, month of April, in those, oh, it was like by, uh, 13 or 16 counties during the Flint Hills, that, that you can't burn brush piles, you can't burn waste. Uh, they don't, the KDHE doesn't allow uh, state burn permits at all. So we've, we've tried to cut down as much as we can on the exceedances uh, during April. Now, what they've done here late, lately, just this last year, they decided to change that and drop from like 75 parts per million down to 70 parts per million. So we expect, and this is me right now, um, we have a lot, we have a lot of rain last year, we have lots of grass out there, uh, we have a lot of people that want to burn in April, and I think we're going to, we're going to 
peak those uh, meters in, in certain cities. And it's not the Topeka meter and it's not the Kansas City meter a lot of times. It's Omaha and it's Chicago and some of those other places. And it all comes back to where the smoke came from originally. So, um, you know, we have a lot of concerns about what are gonna ha what's gonna happen to us uh, and what regulations they're gonna change. Uh, there's a lot of there's a group working on on some of the things right now and I think uh, um, one of the things I want to bring out today is that we have a um, prescribed burning workshop set up at Potter Hall and, and I'll pass this around anybody who wants to look at it or I can get you a copy if you want to uh, on February 19 uh, it's going to be uh, the Riley County Extension K-State Extension and uh, and our and fire district are, are getting together and put this workshop workshop together to try to get some of this information out to the the people that do this prescribed burning uh, throughout the year. Uh, but there there's some ideas out there floating around that they're not going to let you burn on certain years. They won't let you burn in April at all. They're 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 going to um, uh, regulate this by some kind of a lottery system. And and if you're um, Somebody that has range or pasture management, uh, I think most of you understand it, 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 burning is necessary. You know, they, they have to be able to maintain their pasture. It, it gives uh, uh, growth to the cattle. Uh, it, it controls those trees, the shrubs, the, the hedge, the, the cedar trees. Uh, it, it keeps all that out of the pasture. So it, 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 it really does a lot of good things. And, uh, and if we're, regulating that more and more uh, it's going to cause problems and and what it does for me is uh it's, it's going to create lightning storms on on blue sky days <laughs> you know uh, we're going to have uh we're going to have these uh, spontaneous combustion out there in pastures that need to be burned and even if their name didn't come up on a lottery or if they're it wasn't their day to burn so um, you know, we have we have a lot of concerns that that uh, that's going to happen. Um, we have uh, we have our own burn permit system, and, and we actually put our burn permit system in, in uh, just before the, the the state regulations came out. So, and then we had to adopt them a little, or adapt them just a little bit. But um, it, it's worked really good since 1995-1996 when we put it in but uh, we may have to, to, to get with the commissioners get with the community and actually change some of our regulations to meet those KDAG or EPA regulations and uh, right now uh, we don't we, our burn permit system uh, you get it one time a year it's free uh, all we ask is that you call uh, into the uh, either our office or the police department ahead of time and, and get and let us know that you're going to be burning uh, we've actually uh, this year started the the everbridge notification system we're notifying people that want to be notified ahead of time saying okay there's no burning that allowed today and to give them some, some notice uh, we get into april we'll probably be doing that two or three times a day because there are times when we turn the the burning off in the morning because we're going to have high wind. That storm comes through, or that that front comes through, and then we we can turn it back on at three o'clock in the afternoon, and, and get people to to get their burning done when they need to. Uh, we are encouraging people to burn early. I know there's a lot of uh, talk out there. There's some past history, um, uh, especially Kanza, uh, that says that that there are. Um, Good times to burn, there's bad times to burn, and traditionally, that uh, uh, the first week of April is always the the best time to burn because then you've got about 30 days growth. You try to get your cattle in about the first day of May, and, and they're they're eating that fresh green grass and they grow quick. Okay, the other thing that happens is uh, those siblings are out there getting uh, all the sap up in them. So when you burn through that, you get a nice hot fire. It kills off the cedar trees and the, and the buckbrush. So um, 
stopping people from burning in April is, is really going to be a chore. Uh, I talked about it being a religious thing. I, we have people that burn the same day every year. Uh, you know, and, and the only thing that stops them is a real hard rain. I've had people go out and even try to burn in the rain. So uh, those are, are challenges that, that we're out there putting up with right now or trying to to uh, look for uh, ideas how to solve them in the future. Um, I think I think burning is going to continue. I think we have to do that. Uh, I, I am uh, I'm not uh, a big uh, proponent of, of uh, chemically treating trees and killing them off. I think uh, I think the more we can do with the natural way, I think the, the better off we'll be. So uh, you know, if you could share the word, let people know that that there is a workshop out there, I'd appreciate that. And uh, I would, yeah, I wanted to be fairly short, but uh, I would answer any questions you had about burning if I can and, and uh, kind of the direction I see them going. If you had any questions, yes sir. Two questions, one, what's your criteria for declaring a day where you can't burn? And number two, do you, uh, do you have any control over when Fort Riley burns? I'll answer the second one first, no. <laughs> in fact, uh, the like, Fort Riley Fire Department doesn't even have it because uh, a lot of times uh, what they're putting up with is uh, flares and things like that, the, the yeah. pyrotechnics from the, from the artillery. Uh, the, the first one I can answer pretty easy. Uh, normally we look at uh, what it takes for us to fight fire. So uh, normally if we get... Uh, a day where uh, the humidity is down below 40 and and we have a wind above 15 we can't fight fire with we, we just can't stop fire when it gets away we have to go down and chase it find it at the next road and try to stop it or back burn to stop that and uh, so our thought is that most of the the people that are doing prescribed burner out there don't have the, the resources that we have and uh, the only time that we really vary from that is the, if the, uh, and, and actually the weather service uses some of that criteria, they have some more stuff, the, the amount of green and things like that, but they'll put a red flag day on and, and we'll know that ahead of time and maybe a day ahead of time. The other thing is, and, and I've, I've, I've used that, is we've had a, a great day to burn. You know, we have a five, six, seven mile an hour wind and, um, and everybody goes out there because it's a weekend. You know, most of our farmers now are, uh, uh, I will say they're weekend farmers. We have a lot of weekend farmers that, that count on help from people that have jobs during the week. So Saturday and Sunday are good days to burn for them. And uh, so we'll get a Saturday or a Sunday where we have 200 fires going in the county. And, and if we have more than 16 of those get away at any given time, and we've got resources called in from from all the surrounding counties. I'll stop burning. I'll just shut it off uh, and try to get it back under control, and then back open it up when we can. But uh, there there are times when when we've had uh, well, just just two years ago, we had fires going at at Riley, uh, where we had almost every truck in the county out, and I had resources in from Fort Riley and from Gary County and from Pottawatomie County helping us in the county. So, and uh, we still had, still had people calling in wanting to burn. So, uh, is there any, is there a penalty and how do you enforce it? Uh, there is a penalty for, for, for uh, burning without a permit. Uh, and that is, uh, it's all up to the courts. Uh, we had one person last year that was fined I believe it was $800 for, for burning illegally. And uh, actually it was, it was one where um, he chose to burn when nobody else decided to. There was a group of people got together and were, were going to burn and he decided to burn. And uh, we were trying to put the fire out that he started and he was lighting fire behind us. <laughs> so uh, he, he, uh, he actually got, that's, that's the, the latest one. Uh, there are some other ones around, but most of the time, you know, we can we can give them a warning. But there is a penalty phase to this, and it's a. Uh, 
I believe it's a class C misdemeanor or something like that. So it's up to the courts. Yes. I believe you mentioned 96 is when the state regulations took up. What was in effect before that? Well, they, the KDHC had some some uh, some rules and regs that were in effect. Uh, you, you couldn't burn at night. You couldn't burn within 100 feet of a roadway. Uh, there were a, there were a lot of rules that, that they had already set out ahead of time, uh, and some of them were were uh, were not being obeyed at all. I mean, I mean, I don't know how many of the farmers we had that would actually stop 100 feet from a roadway because <laughs> they want to burn right up to the edge of the road, and uh, some of them beat cattle right up to the edge of the road. So, uh, <laughs> but the burning at night. You know, we have a lot of the farm community that burn at night, and, and it's really good for them. They can control the fire. Um, it's it's rare that we ever get a fire that breaks away from those people who are burning at night. But that was a regulation at that time. So there were some good changes at that time. Yes? I have a comment and a question. Uh, first of all, the comment is sometimes uh, we, we uh, take things for granted, and I appreciate you coming here because you do such a great job uh, at your job when we're in, in crisis or in distress. Uh, knowing that you are in the position you are gives us all a lot of uh, security, feeling of security. So I want to say thanks for the great job you do, first of all. My question is, I live out at Tuttle Lake by the dam, and they, they're building a new fire station there. And then your township has one at the other end of the dam. Can you talk about the decision of how those ended up so close together? Well, we have, we have two different districts. Um, Blue Township uh, in Pottawatomie County goes from the St. George District clear up to uh, the Oldsburg District, which covers part of Carnahan Creek Road on that side of the lake. And that's their response area. It's, it's, it's uh, their, the taxpayers uh, pay for that, uh, that service. Uh, in Riley County, we have with 16 stations out there, and and the station that you're talking about at the end of the day is actually going to consolidate the Tatarac station that that uh, is now inside the city limits of Manhattan, and the Tuttle Creek uh, Tuttle Cove Fire Station, which that's that's really a uh, it's an old block building that we needed to replace anyway, uh, on a parcel of ground that I'm not sure is ours. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, 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 when, well, you got to think about that when you're when you're building stations and somebody donates you some some property and and this was back in 1967 or 68. Uh, you, you don't say a lot and, and if it doesn't get transferred into your name and 20 years or 30 years later when you want to build on that property you got to go back and look at it and say well. Maybe we really don't own that, and it's not big enough to put a station on it the size we need, so we need to look at another place. I actually spent almost 10 years trying to find a location to consolidate those those two stations, and uh, we're actually adding a training bay. That's why it looks so big, and some storage uh, for the fire district, too. So, uh, But that's, that's going to be a consolidated station to, to keep, to reduce the amount of stations that we have. That answer your question. Yes, thank you. Yes. Yeah, that, first of all, I would say I'm an advocate for farming, but uh, are there any considerations given to the air quality in Manhattan? There, uh, as far as allowing people to burn. Yeah, the the maybe the number of permits or the timing and how it affects Manhattan. You know, I think that's where the EPA is going. I think that's where, right now, we don't have a consideration, um, but I think that's what they're trying to, to get to. And and uh, we did some studies, uh, several studies last year on, on those peak days where um, you couldn't see three or four blocks in Manhattan. And, and most of the, the time that happened in town here, it wasn't the smoke from our areas. We're kind of like the Chicago. Uh, we had, there were areas in, in South, southeast Kansas that were burning because it was a peak day for them and we got the smoke. Uh, well, Buncey County had a lot of fires the day before uh, one of those peak days and we could actually go to the weather service and pick up, okay, here's the smoke modeling based on what they had from the, 
from the uh, um, from NASA, and uh, we could see where the smoke came from because we knew we, we didn't have any permits or people that were burning that day. So, uh, but I think you're going to see more and more of that. Looking at okay, uh, if if you're burning more than a thousand acres, and that's this is one of the options that they're looking at. If you're burning more than one a thousand acres, you're going to have to come up with a smoke management plan that says okay. This is where the smoke is today. This is where the smoke you you, you create is tomorrow, and and here's where it is by the end of the week. And and if it looks like you have too much smoke going to one area, then then it'll be regulated. Uh, I, we don't have that in there right now, but I think that's an option that we're looking at in the future. KDHE's looking at in the future. Pat, you were talking about wind. But I've been on the K-State campus when there really wasn't much wind and there were straw cinders falling from the sky onto the roofs and the grass and the parking lots at the K-State campus from somewhere to the south. Yeah. And they may have come 30 miles and they just go up and then they come down. Uh, I, I don't think it was wind, but are there dangers from that, from those cinders, from that grass burning? Or? Well, any of that particulate, that's what the EPA is saying, is any of that particulate, and, and, and at, a, at, at a consistent number, could cause problems. And, you know, it could be from anywhere from cancer to respiratory issues. Well, or to fire, I guess. Fire, not, fire's not so, so much. I don't see it's gonna travel that far, but we do have a lot of fires that uh, go from one property to another that way. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I believe you indicated that you might make changes in permission midday, even if the weather changes. Uh, and I was wondering how those decisions are communicated, whether you uh, contact each person with a permit or whether you cooperate with the Weather Channel or you use the internet, or how do you do it? In the past, we haven't had much. We, uh, all, all I do, or what I have done in the past, is I call the, the police department, because normally it's on a weekend, and during the day, uh, eight to five, our our office answers those calls, and people requesting a a, a burn. Uh, on a weekend, it's the police department. Okay, or uh, during the peak burning season, usually from seven thirty in the morning till one o'clock, I have somebody in the office answering that phone because it's just overwhelming to the police department. Uh, but I'll call them and say, okay, we need to shut burning off. So anybody that calls in after that, we don't let them burn. If, if people have already started burning that day, we, we have to put up with it. And we don't have any way of getting hold of them. Well, we may have their phone number, but uh, once they've got the fire on the ground, you know, they're they're working hard to keep that fire under control. So there's not much we can do with that. Everbridge? And our, our answer is Everbridge. So uh, right now, what we'll do starting this year is when we shut that off, we do an Everbridge and anybody that's signed up for the, the prescribed burning uh, part of that, we'll get a notice say on our text phone or email or whatever. Say, okay, burning is shut off, and then we would turn it back on. They'll get a notice. Okay, burning is is going to continue. You can call in now. Yeah, I guess. Uh, is that part of the Northeast Kansas alert system? It is. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's very that's very helpful. I've used for a long time. That, that actually uh, that's a regional thing. So we had there were 23 counties involved in that uh, through the. Department of Homeland Security regional grants, and uh, so there, it's it's not really not costing us anything other than the, the administration of it. One more, I think I had a chance. To uh, yes. Was, uh, is there any evidence of enhanced uh, respiratory problems in the county during that narrow period of time? Is there any data or any correlation? I, I don't know. We were involved a lot with the health department last year in, in coming up with the data that we did, and. and they didn't express any locally, but I. We know that there was some uh, some uh, days of concern, and that we had some complaints, and we're gathering data to establish that baseline. Uh, yes, Karen. I just want to say Pat does a great job. He was such a a wonderful, calm person during the flood of 93 and when I came on as a, a baby commissioner, <laughs> so to speak, uh, they used to tell
tell me some things? And I said, well, I don't understand why the roads won't, you know, form a buffer between the, the fires. And the they took me out and showed me a poor little bunny that got on fire and that they were trying to put out but it was spreading the fire all over everywhere else. <laughs> but could you just talk really briefly about the people who think the fire is out and go away? And that's, that's, a, that's a really good point. You know, most of the fires, we look back and most of the fires, uh, well, we looked at peak days. Okay, we have red flag days. Uh, we have those days where our wind's 15 to 25 mile an hour. And, and we didn't have fires on those days. We had fires the day before. We had controlled burns the day before. You know what I mean? Uh, so the, what happens is, is people burn thinking, okay, the wind's gonna blow this weekend, I'm gonna burn today. They go out and they hurry and they get their, their fire done and then the wind comes up and then it spreads it. So you get a tree that's 20 foot tall uh, and it's burning to the top of it, and and those those ambers that are coming off of it are flying a quarter of a mile. Uh, we, it's just notorious. Uh, we're going to have fires out there uh, the the day after, you know, the, these these big days where we have lots of fires, and and so rekindle is a big problem, uh, and, uh, and and managing those fires. Uh, I'm, and I'm not saying that their people don't manage their fire. Uh, they they put it out to the best of their ability, but there is just uh, a lot of things that, that, that go on, and, and and it takes hours and hours and hours to chase down those those little trees that are burning, or a fence post, or something like this, or or a, or a pack rat's nest. Uh, we've had those burn two days afterwards, it, it smoldered for two days and then the pack rat ran out on fire and, and caused something is what we believe started it. So there's lots of little things that start those fires. All right, thank you. Thank you very much.